Welcome to 10 minutes on Behero Corporate Finance. My name is Tom and I'm going to try to convince you that Behero Corporate Finance is an important topic and I'll try to show you why I think Behero Corporate Finance is an interesting topic. In finance, traditionally, we assume that agents are rational. Agents, we mean primarily managers and investors. We also assume that investors and managers maximize expected utility. We uh, assume that agents, in terms of return and risk, that they there focus on mean and variance. And we assume that agents are selfish. However, if we forget about our model assumptions and look into the real world, we can see that agents are sometimes irrational. They may be too optimistic, they may be overconfident, they may have certain behavioral biases. We also see that agents do not necessarily maximize expected utility. Um, they tend to care about changes in wealth, they are loss averse, and sometimes they're risk averse and sometimes they're risk seeking. Also in terms of risk management, they tend not to focus too much on variance. Instead, they focus on what we say avoid lower tail outcome. That means that they focus on the downside. That's the risky part. And even if we know that people in general are selfish, uh, we also know that people care about people. So we have kind of two worlds, the real world and the artificial world. And that's why I find behavioral finance interesting. Because behavioral finance is actually an attempt to bridge the water between what the traditional finance model prescribe and what we actually see in the real world. Why then I find behavioral corporate finance particularly interesting? Three reasons. First of all, most decisions in the corporate world are what we call idiosyncratic and they're rare. Idiosyncratic means that, for example, if a company is investing in China or taking over an other company, there are specific conditions that relate to their taking over another company or going into China. It's not like just a general decision. On top of that, you don't go into China every day. You don't take over a company every day. So that means that this debiasing through learning is very limited. As opposed to maybe, a, let's go to the other extreme and say a a stock market investor that is day trading. If he or she has the wrong strategy, he or she will learn very fast because money will be lost. Another reason is that decisions in the corporate world really matter. It's not just a division of the cake. We actually, from a society point of view, we're talking about the size of the cake. We're allocating real capital. That really matters that we allocate the capital to its best use. And finally, most of business students are actually going into the corporate sector. And even those students going into the financial sector, many of them will be dealing with corporate clients. As an example, one of the most studied uh, irrationalities is optimism or confidence. Sometimes overconfident kind of includes optimism. So I'll just say optimism. Why is that? Um, first of all, Surveys and studies show that optimism or confidence is a strong and robust phenomenon. People simply tend to be overconfident and optimistic. And the second reason is that it has been shown to have uh, strong implications. This is not a new discovery. Uh, Adam Smith, in his famous book, uh, Wealth of Nations, uh, more than 200 years ago, stated that people tend to overestimate their skills and also their good luck. And it's not something related just to corporate managers. Ordinary people think it's very likely that they're going to be house owners, that they're going to be very old. They think it's unlikely that they're going to get cancer, that they're going to get fired. And they think they're very skilled, for example, in terms of driving their car. When we turn the picture to, to uh, corporate managers that are optimistic, overconfident, we can see that these managers tend to do more investments, to acquire more firms, 
they tend to be reluctant to issue equity. And why is that? That's because they think that the stock market actually prices that company too low. So that the stock price of that company is too low, simply the stock uh, market does not realize the potential of that company and the potential of, their, of them as corporate managers. Finally, you can also see that we have an abundance of entrepreneurs. That is, in spite of the fact that most entrepreneurs actually fail. Not only is behavioral corporate finance nice to kind of try to bridge the water in descriptive terms, but also uh, it has no important normative implications. Um, when we talked about agents, we said it was primarily managers and investors. But it really matters whether it's investors that are irrational, managers rational, or the other way around. If investors, for example, are irrational and managers rational, then it may be correct to protect the managers from these irrational investors. For example, take over defenses. If it's the other way around, sure, the managers should follow the signals of the stock prices. In terms of managing the managers, um, in our traditional model, if we see a manager investing a lot, maybe too lot, uh, too much, uh, then we say, oh, he or she is empire building. It's an agency conflict. But if this manager is simply optimistic, it may be that he or she actually believes that he or she is actually pursuing the interest of the stockholders. Also, in terms of stock options, theoretically, you, you always, oh, you, you um, very often hear that, okay, managers are risk averse. So, in order to ha have that risk profile kind of look like the stockholder, then we have to add stock options. But if managers are also optimistic, then that optimism may counter actually the risk aversion, at least to some degree. So you may put a question mark to the use of stock options, or at least to the extent of uh, use of stock options. This is only one bias. There are a lot of other biases with uh, potential uh, severe effects. There are two main avenues uh, for which behavioral or corporate finance is important. One thing is, if you are going to deal with corporate managers, whether you are a corporate manager yourself, you're a consultant or whatever, if you assume that these corporate managers are rational, selfish, maximizing expected utility, well, you're probably looking at a machine and not, not a real person. You have to incorporate the effect of potential biases. And also, if you're looking inward, and you say, okay, well, if you, for example, are a corporate manager, well, how can you manage your own biases? Well, the first necessary step is to be aware of these potential biases. Okay, to kind of um, round up, it's fine that we have the finance model, but it can only bring us thus far. If we just try to build on this model without looking into the real world, we're kind of build it, building a palace on a junkyard. The, the, the ground is shaky. The assumptions do not hold. That is not to say that we should skip the, fi uh, the traditional finance model, but we have to take the traditional finance model and add behavioral features and reach behavioral corporate finance. Finally, if you want to know more about behavioral corporate finance, uh, there's a super article. It's actually a survey by uh, Baker and Wurkler from last year. And it's a survey on a lot of empirical uh, studies and theoretical studies. If you are interested in behavioral economics, the more broad concept, um, then there's an excellent book by uh, Kahneman, Thinking Fast and Slow. Thank you.